And we're going to start today um, with Dean Julio Frank um, opening the session, and then I will give some vision for the center, and then we'll um, sort of start in with our three very distinguished uh, speakers who will each give a very, very different vision, but congruent with um, the role and vision for the POP Center. So Julio? Thank you, Lisa. Hello. Um, and again, thank you for a wonderful evening last night, I think. Those of us who had the privilege of being there it was really, a, as Lincoln would have said, a very magical moment. Um, I'm a little bit of a contrarian, so when I'm invited to give a substantive talk, I never use PowerPoint slides. But since today I was initially invited just to give some welcome remarks, I decided to use some PowerPoint because Lisa said, no, just don't just say welcome, say a little bit more substantive. So I'm still just going to take the 15 minutes there on the program uh, just to set a little bit of the stage and uh, we're gonna really enjoy a series of fantastic speakers and then the panel at the end. And I'm sure we're going to, to deal much more um, on, on uh, some of these topics. But I do think we're entering a new, a new stage in the development of global health, and um, especially after 2015. And I'd just like, in order to set the context, to briefly remind us all of a series of revolutions that happened on the, on the 20th centuries. And I'm using that word very uh, thoughtfully. Um, then to try and uh, just say one word, because I think Lisa and the remaining speakers will talk more, more, much more about what is the integrated response to the new challenges posed by those revolutions. And then say a little bit of one part of that larger picture, which is um, the questions around global health and particularly um, some of the elements surrounding challenges in global health governance. So you all know all of this, but uh, the 20th century was quite unique. For the half a century of the, the uh, pop center was, was just uh, preceded by a number of fundamental transformations unique in human history. We started with an epidemiologic revolution, which begins by a, this sharp increase in life expectancy, uh, which would more or less remain constant since the beginning of, of humankind. Of course, that's an oversimplification. For most of that history, there were huge pandemic peaks that, you know, Black Plague came through Europe, the Europeans came in contact with the uh, America, the, the New World, um, and there were these huge peaks. But by and large, we had a uh, flat line in terms of life expectancy. And then something happened in the 20th century that by the end of that century, life expectancy had more than doubled. So in those few decades, uh, we experienced a larger gain than in all of the previously accumulated hum history of humankind. But that decline in mortality, reflected or measured by the increasing life expectancy, was only one part of a fundamental three mega, mega shifts in the patterns of disease. And again, I'm not going to talk about in any length this, as Lincoln reminded us, was part of the big uh, intellectual legacy of the um, Pop Center, the whole analysis of health transitions. But fundamentally, a shift at the age of death from young people to old people, a shift in the causes of death from externally driven, like microbes and uh, external threats, to more uh, behavioral, which are, of course, socially conditioned, socially determined um, behavioral uh, elements. And, uh, and then, most importantly, a mega shift in the experience of disease. For most of human history, disease was a succession of acute episodes from, what, from which one either died or recovered only to face the next acute episode. Instead, what disease has become a chronic condition of living. We live, people live with AIDS, live with cancer, live with diabetes, live with a mental illness. It's a condition of living very often stigmatized. And that has changed completely the human experience of disease. When we look then at the landscape, these mega shifts at the global landscape have not happened in a uniform manner. They've been distributed in a very unequal pattern across societies. And therefore, today, what we see globally is what, what I would call a triple burden of disease. There's still a huge unfinished agenda of common infections, malnutrition, and maternal mortality. At the same time, every region in the world, in every region of the world except Sub-Saharan Africa, the emerging challenges represented by non-communicable diseases, mental health and injury, are now the dominant source of burden of disease. Uh, and if that was not enough, 
every country in the world is now experiencing health challenges directly linked to globalization, like pandemics and like uh, the health consequences of climate change. And in our interconnected world, one of the big expressions has been the increase in what I would call the global transfer of health risks. These are not new, they've been all around. The Athenian plague uh, uh, was directly linked uh, uh, of the fifth century BC, was directly linked to trade. It's not new, it's the intensity of these changes that has uh, greatly, greatly accelerated through a whole host of, of transfer of diseases, of, of disease risks. Obviously, global environmental risks like climate change, the movement of people, but it's not just people and microbes that move across borders, it's also lifestyles and ideas. And then there are transfers from rich to poor countries, like the variance in environmental and occupational health and safety standards, which represent a net transfer of disease, the trade in harmful products, whether legal like tobacco or illegal like other drugs, uh, different trade rules that then represent a, ri a risk because they limit access to to medicines, and then the spread of medical technologies itself as uh, evidenced by antimicrobial resistance. And the point today is that the determinants of health are no longer within the control of any one country uh, individually. So this is the epidemiologic revolution. It was um, accompanied by a dramatic fertility revolution, and I won't say anything more except to say, to note in the, uh, in the pink co uh, color, uh, how you know the more developed regions have tended to stabilize and processes that took them a couple of hundred years happen in a much more compressed uh, period of time in the less developed parts of the world and we're moving towards a rapid convergence when it comes to a low fertility scenario of course this is the main driver of the rapid aging of populations which is one of the big themes of the of the pop center and uh, if the pop center was founded at the time of when the fear was a population explosion or a population bomb. There is a second population explosion, but it is the aging of the population. It's the huge growth in the proportion, the share of people, uh, of older people uh, as, as, uh, as part of the population, the change in the population structure. And today, uh, except very notably, uh, most, a big part of Sub-Saharan Africa and then some parts of Central Asia uh, and, and the Middle East, we see, again, this dramatic decline in fertility in countries all over the world. There's, I mean, there's, I, I increasingly find the category of developing countries completely useless because it's such a heterogeneous group of, of countries. When, when you look at fertility, you know, some of the lowest fertility rates in the world today are found in countries like Iran. By the way, with very, very low correlation with levels of religiousness and, and anything else. So there is this massive convergence which is driving um, the aging of the population. And then, of course, it's accompanied by a huge migration revolution. Uh, this is just the number, total number of migrants uh, international, but to that, add the internal migrants. We have now reached the point where there's a majority of people living in cities, and that happened just in the first years of the 21st century, but it's the result of all these accumulated uh, uh, for forces that really um, get unchained as, uh, uh, during the 20th century. We now live in a world where the majority of people live in cities, first time in human history, and that, of course, is uh, posing a whole host of, of very interesting challenges. And then there's a number of societal uh, revolutions, of course, a political transition towards much more elements of uh, democracy, democratic governance around the world, with, again, very um, uneven progress around the world, a lot of backward movement, but a general trend towards much more participation in a much more interconnected, global interconnected society, and cultural transitions, including, very importantly, the changing role of women. Again, main themes of the pop center that we will be talking about. So that photograph actually captures two of those big um, uh, revolutions. And then last but certainly not least, as dramatic as the epidemiologic revolution, as this huge decline in mortality, this complete shift in the pattern of diseases, was a parallel revolution which is called the health systems revolution. This is a 20th century phenomenon. For most of human history, the social function of taking care of sick people and preventing illness and caring for, for, the, for the sick was discharged by non-differentiated institutions like the family or like religious institutions. It's only in the 20th century when the function of taking care of sick people and pr protecting health becomes the function of specialized differentiated institutions, which we call the health system, um, which has grown 
to be now the largest sector of the largest economy in the world, the U.S. economy, one of the largest sectors of the global economy, probably the second largest sector of the global economy, represent about 10% of the global economy, about $6.5 trillion, a major source of employment. Most of us in this room are a, a sample of that. But there are, you know, literally millions, tens of millions of people who make their living out of this specialized differentiated function. Didn't happen like that for most of human history. In fact, hospitals, now that we are surrounded by hospitals, were not healing uh, institutions until the 20th century. They were mostly institutions to shelter, especially the destitute. This is a very recent revolution. It's a major political issue. Just see what's happening in this country. You know, the federal government gets shut down around healthcare concerns. It is a major element of almost any political competition today. And of course, it's an arena for debating some of the most fundamental ethical issues surrounding humans. So this is the last of the revolutions I will talk about. Today, these health systems are subject to unprecedented, uh, uh, an unprecedented alignment of forces, the big epidemiologic and demographic transitions that I already spoke about, the net result of which is an increased burden from diseases that are much more expensive and difficult to prevent and treat. With rapid pace of technological uh, um, uh, innovation, uh, as a result of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the political transitions, the realization that this is a human right, so increase on the demand side as well, with higher education and more female labor force participation, and then, of course, the professional differentiation that I spoke about. So, how, how this, uh, this is a process that started way before, but greatly accelerated in the 20th century. And now we are in the 21st century. And the question is, what is our integrated response? A paradigm that has increasingly taken hold it was formulated 20 years ago as a result of the Brundtland Commission on uh, uh, Environment and Development is the notion of sustainable development, which is shaping now the next set of globally agreed upon goals. I won't say much, I'm sure we will talk much, uh, much about it, but sustainable development means the attempt to integrate, that's what I call this, an integrated response, three major elements of development that have traditionally been treated as separate or distinct. Elements of so social well-being, including health very centrally, with economic prosperity, which is more than growth, it's growth that's also shared, that's inclusive, that's what I'm calling prosperity, it's a little bit more than just GDP growth. In fact, it's much more than just GDP growth. And in a way that promotes not just human health, but planetary health that preserves our uh, uh, environment, other species that we share this environment with, and the general sustainability of our shared home. Now, uh, that is the sort of integrated response that we're aiming for as the 21st century response. To do this, I think one of our biggest challenges is um, to try to in in innovate our forms, our modes of governance. And I'm just going to illustrate this in uh, two minutes. This is all part of a paper that I published with my co-author, Swery Moon, last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. So anyone can read that. It's called Governance Challenges in Global Health. But let me tell you what I see as some of the fundamental governance uh, challenges when it comes to health. And this could be applied to other fields as well. Um, we have a global health system. There are national health systems I already spoke about, but there is a set of differentiated institutions whose primary intent uh, on the global arena is to promote and protect and restore health. We used to live, when the POP Center was founded, in a very simple world. There was WHO, there was UNICEF, and that was it. Not even the, the banks were barely beginning to. I mean, when the POP Center was founded, there wasn't even a department of health, population, and nutrition at the World Bank. So today, in addition to the banks, the multilaterals, we've had this explosion, this pluralism, which has accompanied, not surprisingly, the growth in funding, this uh, amazing growth that happened during the golden first decade of the 21st century. And I won't go into much detail. So today, we have these hybrid institutions, like the Global Fund, like the Glo Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, of course, philanthropies like the Gates Foundations, multilateral com corporations, and the emergence, especially fueled by the AIDS crisis, of a global civil society movement. A much more pluralistic, and of course, this sees our countries, because the global level is not independent of what happens in the countries. Countries have become, health has become much more important politically 
and economically in the countries that form the globe. Surrounding the global health system are a number of other policy arenas at the global level that are fundamental determinants of what happens on health, and we have Sir Michael Marmot, who I'm sure is going to talk much more about that. These are not part of the global health system. Their primary intent is not to improve health, but we, the global health system needs to manage the relationship and promote the defense of health in these other policy arenas. Very importantly, trade and investment, security issues around peacekeeping, the environment, climate change, education, especially of women, questions around migration, which is hugely consequential for health, and agriculture, both as a source of food, which is a good thing, but also as a source of a number of risks uh, if it's not handled correctly. So this is a complex system that we need to govern. And the challenge, we have three big challenges to do that. A sovereignty problem, a sectoral problem, and an accountability problem. The sovereignty problem is very simple. In contrast to national health systems, which can be governed by governments, there is no global government. We have a world polity formed by 192 sovereign nation states. And the problem emerges because health in this world we have in is a national responsibility. It's the responsibility of national governments. Yet both the determinants of health and increasingly the means for governments to fulfill that responsibility are increasingly beyond the control of any one government, including the most powerful governments like the United States government. And that creates this sovereignty paradox that well, whereas we still have health as a national responsibility, the determinants and the means to deal with it are no longer within the control of national authorities. What is the solution? You know, it's not global government because even if some of us might like something like that, that's not going to happen, certainly not in the next couple of centuries, I predict. It is shared sovereignty. It is the question of mobilizing international collective action around shared goals. The second is the sectoral challenge. We, uh, which I just illustrated in the previous figure, there is policy making going on in other arenas and we don't have efficient means of uh, dealing with, with, with those determinants. And finally, there's the accountability challenge, which is both the accountability of the elements of the global health system, because again, there's no, there, there, the tools that national governments have, like political processes like elections or taxation or law enforcement, do not reside at the global level. There's no place to do that. There's also an, another element of accountability, which is this explosion of uh, new entities, which is very welcome. This pluralism is very welcome. But we haven't figured out how do we hold entities like the Gates Foundation, which has huge weight, accountable for uh, the way they invest their money. They are private e sectors having huge influence. So those are the three accountability, uh, the three governance challenges. In my opinion, and we'll end with this, if we are to deal with these challenges, we need to rethink the global health system, not in terms of this incohate collection of entities, which is growing and has grown exponentially, especially since the latter part of the 20th, and especially the first part of the 21st century. It is the, the need to think of a global health system in terms of the fulfillment of those of four critical functions, which are listed there. The production of global public goods, the management of externalities across countries, the mobilization of global solidarity, and a function of stewardship. C global public goods are fundamental. The quintessential is research and development, the sort of products that the Pop Center puts out, but also standards and guidelines, both for national use, like you know, when the World Health Organization produces this magnificent piece of work called the International Classification of Diseases. And unfortunately, this is being underfunded because there's, you know, there's no, I haven't seen a Bono concert to benefit the international classification of diseases. There's no constituency, yet nothing else will, would function without that. And, uh, and then also to regulate international transactions, the pre-qualification process, which allows the trade in generic drugs around the world is an example of those standards. And then, of course, something very important, which is comparative evidence and analysis so that countries can learn from each other, both positive and negative lessons. Second is the management of externalities, very obvious when there are pandemics, um, uh, uh, but there's many, many other externalities, consequences on other countries of the decisions or actions or events that happen in one country. And again, we, we need some form to, of, of uh, governance to deal with those. 
to deal with this function. The third is uh, global solidarity, which is the one we have focused more. By the way, in Europe, this word has no problem. In the United States, for a strange reason, which I still need to investigate, solidarity is somehow identified with movements on the left. It is, that is not true. Solidarity is a word that has been used by almost any, uh, by uh, everyone around the political spectrum. Just remember the name of the trade union that toppled the communist government in Poland. It is not, it doesn't have any ideological connotation. It is a, a word that describes action where you know, some elements of a society, including a global society, uh, uh, assume responsibility for others. And these are the four sub-functions, development financing, which has grown, technical cooperation, humanitarian assistance during acute events, and then agency for this possess, which is what happens, and this is one of the consequences of uh, sovereignty, when countries, which are the building blocks, political building blocks of the world, become themselves the perpetrators of violations against the rights of their people, rights that have assumed, that we have assumed an international obligation to protect. So how do you do that? Uh, well, one of the functions is to serve as an agency for the dispossessed, for groups that are systematically excluded or discriminated against by national, uh, sovereign national authorities. It is a function of the global health system or the global system in general to uh, fulfill that obligation to protect. Finally, a very neglected function, which is stewardship, which is to provide strategic direction to the global health system through things like convening for negotiation and consensus building, the miracle of, in the middle of the Cold War, the Almata Declaration, where everyone agreed on a set of principles <laughs> through negotiation and consensus building, obviously defining priorities, whether explicitly or implicitly, like we have now, if you look at the allocation of money, there's a set of priorities, rule setting, Evaluation as a key part of, um, a, a, of mutual accountability, of dealing with that challenge. And then for the sectoral challenge, the, the a key part of stewardship, which is cross-sectoral health advocacy, defending the elements of health in the other policy arenas that surround the global health system. The, I think we need, first of all, to get some consensus on what are the main functions and then form shall follow function. Then we, we should have a series of institutions rather than what we have today, which is a lot of overlap, especially around what I call global solidarity and a lot of neglect of some of the other critical functions, especially stewardship and the production of global public goods. My conclusion then is uh, that we need to manage these persistent global challenges. They are not going to go away because the fundamental element of uh, uh, maintaining the figure of uh, sovereignty in an interconnected and interdependent world just means that governance will continue to be a major challenge. Uh, that we need greater clarity on roles, who should do what, and then that we should determine institutional arrangements based on consensus regarding the core functions of each actor. I will finish by reflecting that in this, which is a huge both uh, an agenda both for intellectual, uh, what, uh, what, uh, uh, my favorite phrase from last night, uh, combining intellectual integrity uh, with you know, so, uh, social commitment. A lot of these elements, which have been the founding values of the Center for Population and Development Studies, still leave a lot and a very vibrant agenda for the 21st century and for the next 50 years of the Pop Center. Thank you very much.